God has promised to bless the ones that reads the words and understands the words of the book of Revelation. He's going to bless everything you do. He's going to, he's going to make your way prosperous. He's going to give you more friends. He's going to give you a close relationship with your family. He's going to make your job go better. I mean, he's just going to make your way prosperous if you will put a priority to understanding this great book. So this is great. We're, we've, been, um, we've been studying for the month of July. going to go in the month of August. Don't miss it. Um, all right. I want to just tell you that God is uh, showing himself strong in these days. The, the Lord spoke to me before the first of the year. Now, I don't say those words. I hear some people, and God speaks to them all the time. Did you ever hear them? God told me this. God told me that. I, I, I think that God has coffee with some people. Tells them how many lumps of sugar to put in their, you know. I, I just, I'm just honest with you. I, I, I feel like the Lord leads me. He says that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I believe he leads me. But he doesn't always speak to me real plain where I know what he said. But he did speak to me before the beginning of this year. And he reminded me of that wonderful promise that says that I should trust in the Lord with all my heart, lead not into my own understanding. And this is the key. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him. I wonder if we do that. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I want us to put a premium, every one of us, I want us to put a premium on acknowledging the presence and the plan of the Lord in everything we do. That we don't do anything that is slipshod or uh, just by happenstance, but instead we acknowledge that the hand of the Lord is with us and upon us and he's got a plan for our lives for good amen and I want us to take a hold of that praise God I'm here to tell you today that we've not seen the end of what God's going to do for us yet I, I'm glad to tell you that I know that God has brought us to where we are brought us through all kinds of difficulties and hardships to get us to where we are and brought us victory that but I'm here to tell you this. I've said it before, but i tell you again. The best is yet to come. I believe it with all my heart. We're looking at the book of Revelation again today, chapter number 2. And um, I have, I've, historically, there's been a little, uh, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, dispute about the city that uh, this letter was directed to, Thyatira. Um, how many have heard of the Greek island of uh, Santorini? Did you ever hear of that place? Just me and David, we're, we're going to go there sometime, take our wives along with us. And it, it, it is a, a wonderful resort island off the coast of Greece, but it has a city in it by the same, a similar name. In the Greek language, you would have said it's the same, same name. And, uh, but this, was, this book was probably not written to that one, but instead to a Thyatira that was in Asia Minor and was actually between uh, Smyrna and uh, Pergamos in the uh, land of Asia Minor. This uh, place was... Um, a cross-section of traveling. When people were crossing between uh, Europe, which like Italy, Rome, going into the Middle East, they would cross through this region. And with them, they brought a wide variety of false religions, false faiths, false beliefs. And so Jesus speaks to John, the revelator, and he tells him, I want you to write a letter to Thyatira. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. 
I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Now, I want to tell you that that is a sign of a maturing, growing church. What happens to so many people is when they first get committed to Jesus, they get real excited, real involved. They do a lot of, of work because of enthusiasm, a lot of works for, because of enthusiasm, but as time kind of draws on, they get a little bit weary with well-doing. Even the best of us are prone, if we're not careful, to start taking our Christian walk for granted, wanting to contribute less to the kingdom of God. And we are some, somehow uh, less um, seized by the blessing of being brought into the family of God after we've been there for several years. But Jesus says to this church, I'm noticing that the last works are even stronger than the first works were. You're, you're moving in a good direction, growing and maturing uh, in the Lord. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, not everybody was involved in this uh, teaching of this Jezebel. By the way, I don't know where someone got the idea that they had the license to take this scripture and stick it back in the Old Testament and talk about Queen Jezebel from the Old Testament. To do that would be the same thing as if you took Joseph, who was cast into Pharaoh's prison and had the uh, revelation about the seven years of blessing and then the seven years of famine and said, well, that's the same man that was a supposed earthly father of Jesus. The same name, but not the same man. And this woman that's spoken of here in this letter to Thyatira, same name, but certainly not the same woman that was alive during the days of Elijah. Not the same woman. Someone said, well, it's speaking spiritually. Where did you get the idea that he was speaking spiritually of Jezebel? He's talking about a woman that went to that church and she had some moral issues. They should have observed those moral issues, is what Jesus said, and should have removed her from trying to teach. This is a real story. This is not figurative. This is a real event. And Jesus said, I gave her space to repent, but she didn't repent. And so then he gives the warning of pending judgment. Now, not everybody in Thyatira was involved in that, but some were. And Jesus said to those that were not that they should take the responsibility to remove her as being a teacher in that church. Then he said, what's well, quiet in here? People love it when you talk about going to heaven. They don't like it when you talk about judgment, but it's po both part of the story. And so uh, when I read on here, now to you, I, I say, and to the rest that are in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no other put on you no other burden, but hold fast to what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, 
and they shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want you to see that in this church, this was very, this was a church of very special Christian people. These people were not the average Christians. They had in that church some extraordinary men and women of God. They lived in a place that the scripture declares Satan's uh, throne is there. He's got a kingdom there. Had a strong, in other words, there was a stronghold there in Thyatira. Yet in spite of that demonic presence and the temptations that went with it, there were people of God that were remaining true and faithful. And not only that, the longer they served Jesus, the more committed to him they had become. I love, don't you love that song that said, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. I just love that. And that's precisely how our walk with Jesus ought to be. Not a matter of, well, I've served my time. I'm ready to just kind of coast into glory. No, no, no. Our love for Jesus causes us to want to push in closer to him. I love the story of the disciples. They, they were men of various walks of life. And when they got uh, an encounter, a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of them left the vocation that they had followed and just followed Jesus. And for three years, these men, having left their homes and their jobs behind, just, uh, just to get close to Jesus. And um, I guess one of the amazing story, uh, things about the story of the disciples, the apostles, is how that though the Bible says clearly that God is no respecter of person, yet there certainly were three of those apostles. You know, thousands of people followed Jesus, but 12 of them got to be apostles. 12 were apostles, but there were three that were really an inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Well, what if you were Thomas? What if you were Andrew or Philip? And Jesus was going to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and you didn't get invited. Would you have really thought, well, God is no respecter of person then? No. See, there was something about those men. And it wasn't that, that they didn't have the same opportunity that the others had. It's that their hearts caused them to press in closer to Jesus than all the rest. And so here they were, invited to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus took on the glory that he had before the world, uh, the foundation of the world was laid. And they saw him in his glorified uh, nature. It was Peter, James, and John, those same three, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that Jesus asked the other disciples to stay in one place and pray, but he took those three men, Peter, James, and John, and went just a little further and asked them to stay there and pray with him. Having some kind of a feeling of comfort that these men were praying in agreement for him during the day of his greatest trial, Jesus separated them and asked them, please, to pray. So there were certainly three, but you know among the three, I got to tell you there was one that pushed in a little harder than all the rest. He, he couldn't hardly stand when he was writing the gospel story himself to call himself by name. So he referred to himself as that disciple whom Jesus loved. I know that God is no respect of a person, but there had to be a reason that on the night of that so-called last supper, it was he that as the disciples reclined at dinner, he laid his head over on Jesus' chest. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. 
What I'm simply telling you is it's really up to us. We can press in more if we want to. We can say that we're not satisfied to serve Jesus from a distance. Instead, we intend to serve him with our whole heart, with our strength, with our might, everything that was in, is within us to press in and take hold of our relationship with Jesus. And there were people in Thyatira that were just exactly that kind of believers. But then there was this Jezebel. There was this woman who had two flaws. First flaw was she had an immoral life. Now, Jesus revealed it. You know, no one likes a whisper campaign. But this woman was living in immorality. She had not one but many immoral relationships. That alone should have uh, disqualified her to be a teacher in the church of Jesus. But beyond that, she taught two grievous doctrinal errors. And um, the first was the practice of idolatry, worship of the idols that included, in many cases, fornication. So many of the false religions of that day, fornication was part of their false religion. And according to what Jesus is saying here through John, it appears that that was part of what she was teaching. But beyond that, she taught them to eat meats that were offered to idols. Long story here we could go into. You know, the Bible tells us that meats are nothing. If they're eaten with thanksgiving, it's fine. She obviously was teaching them to eat those meats offered to idols as acts of idolatrous worship. I mean to tell you this woman had her place in the church as far as having a station and an office in a position she was a teacher but her teachings were false and I want to tell you this the reason I mention all this and go into some length that uh, as about it today with you is that the Bible warns us that in the last days perilous times shall come we don't use that word every day I don't know other when I preach if I've ever used perilous as a word before so I just think I'll just talk to you about that word for a minute simply means dangerous perilous times means dangerous times now listen not dangerous times when John was writing this in the first century dangerous times in the last days if there were false teachers in dangerous times when this was written back before the year 100 uh, AD how much more are there dangers like this that's put before Christians today. False teachings, false religions, false Christs, false miracle workers. There is deception that is laid before us today and it causes the church to need to become circumspect in their activities, in their beliefs, in their religious uh, practices. We need, if there ever has been a time when the people of God need to take earnest care, earnest heed that their walk is according to the plan of God. This is the day that we should be walking that walk. This is the day when we should keep that timely inspection. Now, I want to show you what God does. You know, sometimes people get the feeling that if they've done something, committed an act, or they have... Um, taking on an attitude, and if it was really wrong, God would have judged them for it. And since God didn't, well, then it must be okay. And besides that, they could say, I know other people that do the same things. I know other people that have gone to the same places. I know the other people that have told the same stories, and they're supposed to be Christian people too, and God hadn't judged them, so it must be all right. That's because you don't understand God. I said, you do not understand God. When somebody commits an abominable act, it can be something that's worthy of eternal 
damnation. God does not usually step in immediately and judge them for it. It's called the mercy of God. Let me tell you something. People do not really seem to understand the mercy of God. Some people think because God's merciful, he just lets things slide. You do something that displeases him, but he just lets it go. That's his mercy. That is not the mercy of God. The mercy of God is the, sp uh, the span of time between when somebody commits a sin and when they give an account for it. That's the mercy of God. He will, he will not let a sin go under the carpet. Someone commits a sin and maybe 40 years pass before they give an account for it. And they think, well, God didn't care or God forgot. No, he didn't. That means that God had mercy and he was giving you space to repent. And Jezebel was, was in this church committing these terrible sins and teaching these awful false teachings and God didn't judge her yet. Why? Because God's not like you. And even though this woman was in sin and was teaching people to sin, God loved her and was giving her space to repent. That's the mercy of God. You've got mercy on you today and I have on me. We've got an opportunity today to get things right with God. Doesn't mean that God didn't notice if there was things wrong in our life. It means that he's merciful and he's given us space to repent. Doesn't mean that he didn't care. It meant that he's merciful and he's given you the opportunity to get your life right. In the book of the Psalms, the psalmist talks about this very principle that I'm speaking to you about today. He's talking about the silence of God. Someone is committing an abomination and God is silent. Doesn't say a word. The righteous heart is vexed and cries out for vindication. But God, the silence. And the whole time God is silent, he is lining up the judgment against that offender. He didn't forget it. He wasn't covering it up. It wasn't because God didn't care. He was giving that person the opportunity to repent. But the whole time, his mercy's given opportunity. He's lining up judgments. And the psalm said the day will come when those judgments will march against that offender like an army. Like an army, they will come one troop after another, one phase of judgment after another. Jesus said, if this woman does not repent, I'm going to throw her in a sick bed. If she doesn't repent, those people that have committed fornication with her, I'm going to throw them in a sick bed. And her children, I'm going to kill with death. You say, well, I don't think God does it. Well, I don't know what you think. I'm reading here. The book of Revelation, chapter number 2, says he does it. And see how people shout? When you talk about judgment, they just really love to run the aisles when you start talking about judgment. No one likes to think about judgment because every one of us knows that if it were not for the mercy of God, we would all be under the judgment. But during the mercy, we must respond to the opportunity to repent. And Jesus said, if they will repent, I will give them mercy. But if they won't repent, I will bring judgment. I'm glad about this. You know, God is able to reserve judgment or to bring judgment on those that refuse him. And at the same time, he's going to protect those who walk uprightly. I'm going to tell you something that um, is not a popular thing to say. I don't say it because I get any satisfaction from saying it, but I'll tell you this because 
Number one, because it's the truth, and number two, because it's important. There is going to be judgment that's going to come to the sin, on the sins of America. And um, but I, I remember back in September of 2001, this attack upon the Trade Center, and the people of America with one voice at that time cried out in repentance and, and asked God for mercy. That lasted for about a month until we went back worse than we were before. Someone said, well, that's the judgment of God. Listen, that was two buildings. When the judgment of God comes, it will, it will make that look like a wiener roast. When the judgment of come, God comes, it will not be limited to two buildings. It's going to come. Now, here's my word of peace for you. The Bible talks about a day. This doesn't directly concern us except by example. After the believers have gone in the rapture, we'll be talking about this on Sunday night in the next few weeks. But after the believers have gone, there will be a group, a large group, of Jewish men that will come to realize after the rapture what has happened. Out of 12 different tribes of Israel, 12,000 men from each tribe. And God will cause these 144,000 witnesses to be marked in their forehead. I don't know if you'll be able to see that mark or not, but the spirits, in the spirit world, they'll see it. God said, mark these men, 12,000 from 12 tribes, 144,000 men. And they are a testimony throughout the tribulation. It's important that they're there because the believers went in the rapture, they're gone, but in this tribulation, here's 144,000 Jewish believers converted after the rapture, and they're sealed with a mark in their forehead. And if you know anything about the tribulation, the book of Revelation, then you know that vials of God's wrath begins to be poured out upon the earth. And the... Uh, Thunder judgments, you know. And um, millions, billions of people on the earth are going to lose their lives. But this 144,000 are marked by God and they're protected all through the first half of the tribulation period. They're protected. And People are dying because of pestilence. People are dying because of earthquakes. People are dying because of famine. But the 144,000, they're protected. There are even spiritual beasts that are released upon the earth to torment men and their, their tails sting like the sting of a scorpion. And men will wail because of these beasts and when they get stung by them, they'll be crying out, let me die. But they, d d death will flee from them. I mean, it'll be terrible. But the 144,000, they've been marked, and those beasts will leave them alone. Do you, do you get this? What I'm telling you is there may be some things flying around even now, judgment because people have turned their back on God. But we're marked. I said his hand is upon us for good. We want to we wanna keep the mark of God showing in our life. Can you say amen to that today?